let's talk a little bit, and I don't want to talk too much about the Equatorial Current System, um, even though it's complex, and even though this is a place uh, where we have El Nino, La Nina variability, we've already gone through some of that. Um, it does include the monsoonal circulation, so I do want to just mention it a little bit. The North Equatorial Current, which we find both in the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean. Um, the, in the Atlantic Ocean, it actually extend as far north as 20 degrees north, so that's not very equatorial by any means. They're usually fed from flows from the eastern boundary currents. They supply flows to western boundary currents because they flow along the equator. They gain heat from the sun. They're really the warmest currents in the world ocean, and really this is where the ocean picks up its heat, and as those currents head towards the poles on either side, other, either hemisphere, they help to distribute heat. So in the same way that the global atmospheric circulation distributes heat to higher latitudes, ocean circulation as well through the equatorial currents also supplies heat to northern and southern hemisphere and higher latitudes. So it's another circula circulation system and another way of distributing heat along the globe, throughout the globe. South Equatorial Current tends to be uh, broad and sluggish, um, in some places somewhat ill-defined. Uh, in the Atlantic and Pacific, the South Equatorial Current actually crosses the equator. So if it crosses the equator, that doesn't make it the South Equatorial Current. I guess we call it the North-South Equatorial Current. Um, in, in any case, intersects with the North Equatorial Current. And there's important physical reasons why this whole thing is displaced northward. As I described earlier, the ITCZ, the Intertropical Convergence Zone, is displaced slightly northward. And it has largely to do with the fact that the South Pacific Ocean is such a large basin. That's part of the reason why. Um, in any case, uh, the South Pacific Equatorial Current also bifurcates at the western boundaries. Some of it flows south, some of it flows north. Uh, into the equatorial countercurrent. This is a, a return flow, essentially, that brings water that has moved from east to west back towards the east. And it's seasonally variable. It may have a north and south component. Again, we're starting to get into some of the details of it. Um, the equatorial ca countercurrent in the South Pacific Ocean um, is part of it is the equatorial undercurrent, which really is technically not a surface current. It's sometimes called the Cromwell current, and it's named after Cromwell, who actually discovered this flow of water underneath the surface of the ocean at depths between 200 and meters at its western end and 60 meters at its eastern end. This current that kind of climbs the slope between the western and eastern sides of the Pacific. Ocean. So it's just a way to sort of introduce and give some character to some of the ocean currents. The details aren't necessarily so important, um, but just helping you understand the circulatory system, just like understanding your arteries and veins and those kinds of things in your own circulatory system. The North Equatorial Current in the Atlantic Ocean deserves a special mention because this is an area where hurricanes, where most of the hurricanes that affect the United States form. This is sometimes called Hurricane Alley, and you can see that this is, again, a more idealized kind of representation of currents in the ocean and the land masses as well. But it's this area here that as tropical disturbances uh, and tropical waves, easterly waves, form um, traveling from Africa towards the United States, that we get that kind of circulation that makes up tropical cyclones. And for that reason, this is sometimes called the Hurricane Alley. All right, I mentioned before that I wanted to talk about the Indonesian through flow. And the Indonesian through flow isn't something that you're going to read about probably in any other textbook currently because it's a fairly new recognition and anything new in science is maybe 10, 15, 20 years old. Um, it takes that long for word to trickle up. But the Indonesian through flow represents what's coming to be known as choke points in the ocean. And choke points are areas that exert some kind of control over the rest of the ocean. And let me give you an example. Here in Southern California, there's a place where three freeway systems meet. The 22 freeway and the 57 freeway and the 5 freeway meet at a place that's often called the Orange Crush. And it's called the Orange Crush because it tends to get jammed during commuter hours. Three freeways, one trying to merge onto the other, everything coming together. It's a mess. 
If you were trying to travel from here in Fullerton to, say, San Diego, and got caught in the Orange Crush, it could take another hour to get there to San Diego than if there's no traffic in the Orange Crush. So that region, that intersection between those three freeway systems is a kind of choke point. It limits how fast traffic may go from one location to the other. And the Indonesian through flow in a similar fashion represents what's called an ocean choke point. It exerts rate limiting effects on current flows and exchanges of waters in different regions of the world ocean. The Drake Passage is another choke point and oceanographers are currently at work identifying how these different spots in the ocean, the Drake Passage, excuse me, being down below South America, between South America and the Antarctic Peninsula, a very relatively narrow part of the ocean, limiting exchange of water between the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean. So these choke points may be really important in terms of not only ocean circulation, but also in terms of Earth's climate as well, because they control the rates at which heat is exchanged between different oceans and different parts of the ocean. So let's take a look at the Indonesian through flow. And this is from a fairly recent article in Oceanography Magazine. It's based on that. And you can see the Indonesian through flow is really a series of currents and these currents will depend, will, will change um, seasonally. So here are these blue arrows with these double-headed blue arrows. The, the flows here are going to change seasonally. This is water coming from the South Pacific Ocean. This is water coming from the North Pacific Ocean. So even though we're below the equator here, we're still getting water from the North Pacific Ocean that's flowing in through here and actually moving into the Indian Ocean. And it's the movements of water through these island chains of Indonesia that limit exchange of waters from the Pacific Ocean to the Indian Ocean. And so if there's lots of warm water being transported, then the Indian Ocean may get warmer. Otherwise, if this is not a great flow, the Indian Ocean may get colder. Um, that's just an example of the kinds of ways that it might limit exchanges between the two oceans. It just depends on how fast the currents move through here. And that has profound long term on the, on, say, decadal and perhaps even centennial scales over the course of hundreds of years um, effects on circulation of currents through the world ocean as well as perhaps um, effects on climate because ocean heat content in this region can also affect climate. All right, so mostly what I want you to be aware of is the Indonesian through flow is an example of a choke point and choke points are local or regions of the world ocean that are like control valves over how water flows throughout the world ocean in the world ocean circulation.